In 2012, the director of the Devil May Cry series, Hideaki Itsuno, would release his dream game, Dragon's Dogma, which was a hybrid of something he was used to working on, fast-paced hack-and-slash combat, along with a somewhat traditional open-world fantasy RPG setting. And now, after years and years of waiting and seeing if it would happen, the sequel has finally been released. Some people waited for over 12 years, I only waited for 4. But regardless for how long the series was on hold, this was well worth the wait. Dragon's Dogma 2 might not be a perfect game, it's arguably just as polarizing as the first, but it is a passionate one. Despite having many elements that have become more tiresome in the decade-long gap since the first game, like the Chosen One archetype, although the Arisen arguably isn't one, but that's neither here nor there, a pretty standard fantasy setting, only one save file at launch, and a ridiculously big open world, but at no point does any of this game feel like it's paint by the numbers. At every point, from the good to the not so good, the entirety of Dragon's Dogma 2's identity feels unique to itself. The story is probably where I'll have the most to say, but gameplay has to come first because, oh boy. As a self-admitted fan of the first game, Dragon's Dogma 2 takes everything I like about Dark Arisen and plucks out most of the frustrating bits. There's still some left, but the difficulty curve is easier to get around for the most part, although that first trek through Batal was particularly gruesome. The opening is much more dynamic and gets you into the mix of things faster than any RPG I can think of. The character feels much more integrated into the story despite still being mute. Obtaining new vocations costs way less, so switching your class on the fly doesn't completely fuck you over this time around. And the character creator, oh god, it's, it's perfect. So much customization from the body type to the face to even the amount of teeth you want your character to have. This can only be rivaled by something like Saints Row Reboot, arguably, uh, Neo 2, and maybe Rise of the Ronin from what I've seen of that game. Everything here, character creator and all, feels like a step up from the first, and this is coming from someone who's bought that thing three times. In 2013, when Itsudo said that the original barely scratched the surface of what the team wanted to be included, but was cut due to budget reasons, I can totally see that now. Not only with additions like the new Beastrin race, but the absolutely massive and seamless open world. I can attribute it a bunch of different adjectives, but I really can't portray just how big the world of Dragon's Dogma 2 is. Each town and area feels visually distinct from the previous one. All of them have their own sense of culture and history, which is a good thing, despite what little time we actually end up spending in the kingdoms during the story missions. But most importantly, all the different parts of the map come together to create one cohesive world. Not completely different areas that just feel stitched together. It's also not big just to slap that on the back of the box. The world is dense, both visually with mountains and forests, but also with things to do. Even on my New Game Plus playthrough, at 40 hours in, I was still experiencing new areas to go to and caves I'd never come across. There's some small ways that that can be a detriment, but I'll explain that later. The moment-to-moment -moment combat has always been the main sell for the first game, and it's no different here. Even if the story doesn't grab you at all, or you're not really into fantasy like I wasn't when I first began playing it, the gameplay is what keeps you invested. The most notable features like the pawns and scaling bosses are still great, the latter of which is actively encouraged more this time around since there's even more weak points that can't be accessed on the ground at all. Vocations have been renamed this time around, but there's still the classic fighter, mage, thief, and warrior, which I opted for it in. By God was my main character a fucking barbarian, dude. There's even some new ones you get near the later part of the game like Mystic Spearhead and Wayfarer both of which were the best and were my main classes for the last 15 or so hours. Some have complained that enemies like harpies, wolves, goblins, and bandits are encountered from beginning to end with no variety. However, not only do the enemies differ in how they look in each area, but how they operate. Late game hobgoblins in the volcanic island are no fucking joke since they're much bigger and often travel in larger packs with shields, blunt weapons, and what I think are Molotov cocktails. Plus, there's entirely different enemies that only come out at night, so this game is not lacking in enemy variety. Throughout your playthrough, you'll encounter many different mini-bosses, most of which are optional. There's drakes, which are just smaller dragons, 
golems, minotaurs, ogres, and trolls. Yes, they're still super perverts. But it's almost like Capcom can tell whenever you're getting too big for your britches this time around because about halfway through the game, they begin to throw multiple at you. So one troll very quickly turns into two trolls and some wolves for good measure. On my first venture to the second major town, Batal, there's two golems as well as a griffin that are all out to get you at the same time. And the challenge is not just fighting these three big monsters, but finding a way to still make headway and to not undo all of your progress. And to be honest, the first time fucking pissed me off. But once you realize things like the golems only wake up when you walk near them, and if you're really underleveled, the griffin will just fly away after a little bit, it all becomes a little bit more manageable. To some, this may feel a bit too challenging, maybe even unfair, and to be honest, I get it. There's some small difficulty jumps that didn't really jive with me, and while not as stats heavy as the first, Two can sometimes emphasize leveling and numbers over sheer skill. But I can assure you that Dragon's Dogma 2 doesn't hate you or whatever people are saying. It's definitely rough and expects you to fail more than a couple times. However, when you begin to take advantage of the new systems like ox carts, which take you from major town to major town for only 200 gold, or camping, which allows you to not only save but switch out your skills, refill your health bar to the max by resting, and even add stat buffs if you cook, those difficult fights get a lot less daunting. Not to mention that once you visit an area and put a port crystal there, you can use fairy stones to fast travel you. It's expensive, but there is a fast travel system. I just don't see how the game not letting you go in the map and just select a city and then you get there in two seconds is a negative when the entire game is built around you getting lost in its world. Of course, that doesn't mean I don't have my gripes. Um, there was a lot of them. The pawns are much more interesting in Dragon's Dogma 2. The conversations they have give them a lot more character and even comment on quests or random things in the world that feel very in the moment. I can't imagine the amount of voice lines that had to be recorded for that, but they still repeat their dialogue all the fucking time. Despite one of the big marketing points of this game being that it was fixed. Uh, the romance system works even less this time around, I noticed. I don't think it was brought up in a tutorial at all. Not not only did I find it less compelling to romance someone, despite the game really wanting you to boink one of the two main ladies, but it was hard to get attached to either of them since they seldom show up in the story outside of two short missions each. Also, I, I think the affinity system is just fucked this time around, since doing an NPC's missions counts as getting closer to them, so I ended up with that one drunkard arisen as my beloved for the final confrontation when I only spoke to him to get the Wayfarer vocation. See, I, I got Fornavolt. The soundtrack wasn't as dynamic or as identifiable as the original was. The boss themes were good, but the themes for the towns or the overworld or even the combat, it all seems as if the composers this time around wanted to veer away from the big show boatiness with the emphasis on vocals and sort of lean more into the fading into the background OST, which is kind of where Capcom soundtracks have been going for the past decade or so. And that's a bit of a shame. Although I will say that the ending song and the main menu theme are pretty good. That ending song is so, so good. It's genuinely up there with my star from Final Fantasy 16. But for the rest of the soundtrack, I honestly wouldn't be able to distinguish this from any other fantasy thing. Okay, um, rip people watching this in the far, far future, but I have to talk about the microtransactions. Dragon's Dogma 2 having paid traveler kits and currency is fucking stupid. Not because these are items that you can only get by paying extra money. On the contrary, they're no different from the tickets from last year's Resident Evil 4 Remake since they're just in-game items and in-game currency that you're only buying to obtain instantly as opposed to unlocking them manually. There's no pay to win, no season pass, these are just meant to make your experience easier. And it's fucking dumb. One, because they're in-game items, you will unlock all of this shit like two hours into the game. And two, because it's just Capcom's new method of making a few extra bucks these past few years. I understand the frustration. For sort of as long as I've been reviewing games, I've been vehemently against microtransactions and paid DLC, even if it's just cosmetics, because cosmetics are sometimes a reason that I continue to play a game. But spreading misinformation and hyperbole doesn't help 
either. To be honest, if you weren't yelling from the rooftops last year about the Resident Evil 4 remake, then it's a little weird to be doing it this time around when there's other controversies about the performance. Feels a little bit more like sacrificial trash as opposed to honest criticism. There, there's your mini editorial that you're never gonna fucking get as a separate thing. NPC permadeath has been added and was a huge selling point before the game was released. And at first, I was decently excited when the game showed me a tutorial about it. But here's the thing. Permadeath can add a sense of urgency if an NPC is tied to a quest or is one you're interested in, be it romantically or just for the story. And ideally, I like it on paper. As much as I've criticized Bethesda's sort of archaic game design that sells itself as a do whatever, go wherever game, while actually being very uniform, especially in recent years, you'd think that this would be right up my alley. And it would be if Dragon's Plague wasn't a thing. Outside of the ending, which we will get to in due time, just hold your stinking horses, lady, Dragon's Plague is a solely in-game thing. It's never explained in the actual story, just in pawn dialogue over and over and over and over and over. It's essentially, I shit you not, an STD that travels from pawn to pawn in a party that's a ticking time bomb before your companion turns into a dragon and levels a city. Whether it's one you hired or your loyal one, one that you created at the beginning of the game, it can happen to either of them. I will say that this is an incredibly innovative system, showing how even when the first game broke new ground with the creation of the pawn system in the first place, the devs did not want to become complacent. The only issue is that there is only one save file. Mind you, they can only destroy the city when you sleep in an inn, but if this happens in a major city, I think your save file is just ruined. Unless you're able to obtain enough wake stones and revive everybody in the limited time before they disappear completely. Now, on one hand, it's a great way to tie the story closer to the gameplay by making one of the core aspects of Dragon's Dogma into another thing that you have to be wary of. The connection between an Arisen and their pawn was always a constant thing, and now it can be completely ruined without you even noticing it. However, that can be a little anxiety inducing to the point of kind of being a nuisance. Especially later in the game, my pawn, Lionel, named after Lionel Richie, constantly contracted it and I kept having to kill him, which lowers your invisible affinity meter, because of course there is one. And of course that's something that the game doesn't explain to you and I only found out about it after completing the game because I didn't get the full true ending. Oh my fucking gosh. There's some other stuff that bothered me a little bit, like the difficulty scaling feels a bit off. With a full party at level 41, random encounters can still be somewhat difficult, but the final boss of the game was way too easy. As I'll explain, I beat it twice without dying once. That is not me stunting on anybody, I suck at games. But that stuff aside, the game itself is great. The story is a... Uh... Despite what YouTuber marathons and retrospectives will make you think, most people will not start a series chronologically, and instead will just jump into the most accessible title. Sometimes an earlier game isn't fun, or maybe you just want to be in on a new thing. And I say all this to relate that I'm looking at Dragon's Dogma 2 not only as a fan of the first, but as a standalone game for those who are just looking at this with no idea what the fuck they're looking at. And through both of these lenses, 2 is very interesting. The entire the premise of Dragon's Dogma 2 is that the Arisen, this person who has their heart taken by the dragon and is destined to fight in order to get it back, has somehow, through a mysterious magic spell that's never really explained, has had their memories stolen and they end up getting all of them back by like hour two. The intro of the game isn't even done by the time you get your memories back. But because of that, we learn that the Arisen is supposed to be the rightful ruler of the kingdom of Vermund, which is sort of the main kingdom this time around. Around. However, there already is an Arisen on the throne, but there's only ever supposed to be one in the world at one time. So now you have to uncover this entire conspiracy. As a setup, it does a great job of summarizing the lore for those who skipped the original or have just forgotten in the past decade, as well as keeping the story moving relatively fast for the first two to three hours. It's sort of like the political intrigue, which is something that I'm rarely ever into. But I was completely on board with retaking the throne and there is this plot between two leaders of rival countries working together to stop the Arisen. It sort of lost me by the time we get to Batal, which is about halfway through the game. The entire main story sort of falls apart by that point since the game almost expects you to get lost in side quests and other shenanigans that you can do. In Back Batal, there's a plot about this attempted assassination of the leader of the country and... 
that's really it. Once you stop her assassination, find out who ordered the hit, that's pretty much the end of the game's second act for main missions. Save for one where you pretend to be a pawn, that one was pre done particularly well. While you are required to go to the three main different areas to complete the story, there's still outposts in other villages like Harv that you can spend little to no time in at all. In the 36 hours it took me to roll credits the first time around, I didn't even realize that the rumor of an elven village in the forest was real until the final hours of my playthrough. And by that point, you're supposed to have relationships with these people. News to me, in lots of ways, this is good and encourages player exploration. And had the story been more put together, this wouldn't be a negative at all. But specifically when it comes to Dragon's Dogma 2, it feels like some of the more fetch questy missions could have been replaced with some that took us to different parts of the world. Or, at the very least, double down on Vermund being the main kingdom. Because once Batal is introduced with its rough story, there's little to no reason to return to Vermund for main missions. Which, besides beating the dragon, is the entire point of this fucking story. It seems like once the idea of upping the number of kingdoms from one to two was brought in, that's kind of where the flow train stopped. And it's a shame, because like I said, the, the, the villages and kingdoms themselves are really well done, I just feel like they're extremely underutilized. And while we're on negative story things, uh, the ending. I did not like it. At all. Initially, at least. So once you complete the two to three main missions in Batal, the final task is a hunt for smaller dragons in order to fix the God's Bane that you retrieve from this game's version of the Seneschal, which I'll explain in a minute, that's a whole other thing. That boss fight with the Drake in Moonglint Tower was so much fun. And afterwards, it seems like there's going to be this calm before the storm once you rebuild the sword. Probably reclaim the throne, rule the kingdom for a little bit, and then fight the dragon in due time. Everyone you talk to in the hour or so leading up to the ending says that the dragon will show up when he needs to. So it seems like there's enough time. But man, once you get the God's Bane, it's a never-ending sprint to that finish line. You fight Talos, this robot thing... And then the very next thing is the final boss with the dragon. Then credits. And I just sort of slumped back in my chair at 5 a.m. Sun rising, shining in my, th my fucking face through the blinds. And I just said, that's it? The third act of Dragon's Dogma 2 lacked the density and experimentalism of that first game. The dragon doesn't even get a fucking name this time around. Once you kill him and reclaim the throne, it leaves a feeling of emptiness as the credits roll on. For what's supposed to be the good ending. However, it's supposed to feel that way. While reclaiming the throne is the happiest ending, kind of, it's not the true one. At your coronation, you come in contact with the Pathfinder, this pale, bald ghost who's been helping guide you throughout the entire game. Except now, he's revealed to be the true mastermind behind it all. Why, you ask? Hold your questions until the end, please. He sends you back in time before your conflict with the dragon, and my dumbass not picking up on what the game wants me to do, did the entire final fight over again, half asleep at 5.30. Man, once I got to the coronation again, I was so damn lost. What you're supposed to do is use the God's Ban on yourself, killing yourself and breaking the cycle. Except this is only the beginning of the end. So in Dark Arisen, the big reveal at the end is that the story of the Arisen and the dragon fighting each other is an eternal cycle. The dragon doesn't just come into existence, he wasn't born. He was originally an Arisen that failed to stop the Seneschal, the ruler of the world. Basically, there's a few different ways that an encounter with the dragon can go. You can fail outright, you can avoid the fight with the dragon by sacrificing the one you love like a bitch, or you can fight him head on, apply directly to the forehead. So Grigori, the dragon from the first game, used to be an Arisen, and if you kill him, but not the Seneschal, then you become the next dragon. If you kill both, then you ascend and become the next Seneschal. At first glance, it's easy to say that it's just another JRPG where you fight a god. Except to be accurate, it's one where you fight a god, become one, and then kill yourself. I explain all that to make it clear that I was very concerned with how 2 would try to have an interesting third act, considering that it can't just retell the original ending of the first game. But, especially since it's a sequel to a game from two console generations ago, it has to be careful to not lose new players. 
So, when you were sent to fight the dragon again, you actually break the cycle. The thing that's been a wish for every dragon and arisen in this series so far, and is even sort of the point of this game's dragon's monologue. Simply put, Dragon's Dogma sets up the lore and has a lingering thread of possibly breaking the cycle, while 2 yanks that. The Pathfinder wants the Arisen to kill the dragon and rule the Kingdom of Vermund because that's how he wants the story to go. Hence why the good ending felt like a hollow victory. And it's here where Itsuno sort of just said, Hey, you guys ever seen Donnie Darko? Where due to a choice that the main character made, he's put in a pocket dimension and the world is going to end within a limited amount of time unless he's able to undo the mistake. And ultimately the world is saved by Donnie sacrificing himself, allowing the world to continue turning. While people will come to forget him, they will never forget his sacrifice and I'm only being 30% sarcastic. The true ending consists of killing the Pathfinder, no shit, your pawn taking over Talos, and killing dragons single-handedly, which is awesome, before they eventually become one due to Dragon's Plague. But since the brine is finally gone, which were these evil eels that hide in large bodies of water and are actually controlled by the Pathfinder, that's new, the people of the world are finally able to sail the seas in peace without fear of another dragon, or an Arisen. The end. What does any of it mean? I don't fucking know. It's a story with a lot of rough patches, but is able to pull everything together in the end and have such a gut punch ending. I love the idea of the unmoored world, having the brine turn from some excuse to keep the player within the bounds of the map into this canonical force that the Pathfinder wields to keep his story moving along is amazing. But the gameplay itself for this final stretch is a bit, Mm. It ramps up the difficulty a couple notches over the main game. You're plopped into this world with the same items and health that you had at the end of your fight with the dragon, which for me was very low. There's constant enemies, more than there are at nighttime, and you can't rest too often if you want to complete everything, since there's a limited amount of days. How many exactly? I don't know. The game doesn't tell you at all. But you can't not rest since you need your health to be full, and you don't want to die and be sent all the way back to the beginning. What you're actually doing during this final endgame stage is sort of a boss gauntlet with quests in between them to convince the leaders of all the different villages you visited over the course of the game and try to get them to the safe point. I like how this section looks, and I do appreciate the writing that these side characters get despite being very underutilized, but whenever I wasn't fighting a dragon, this final section of the game felt much more like busy work. At one point, I accidentally selected no when the game prompted me to use a wake stone and because the end game only saves when you rest, I had to redo an entire hour and a half worth of bosses and missions. Mmm, I, I, I love it. The save system was probably changed to add to that oppressive atmosphere that's present in the story, which is cool, uh, but that doesn't mean that I have to like it. Also, the seafloor shrine that sprouts out of the ocean is just Grand Soren, the main kingdom from the first game. Something I didn't believe when I saw it online until I got to the end game and went, oh shit. I know this layout. What does that mean? Again, I don't fucking know. And I'm not entirely sure that the dev team knows either. But it is pretty cool. Dragon's Dogma 2 is just as imperfect as the original, just in different ways. But it still managed to keep that addictive nature this series has. Far too often is perfection seen as the bar that games need to reach up to, when what really matters is the good stuff outweighing the bad. And how the entire experience, both positive and negative, makes you feel something close to joy or sadness when it's all said and done. So yes, the main story is rough, the microtransactions are dumb, the, the end game is a bit mm, and there's other minor annoyances, but for every wolf that dragged me away or troll that threw me across the terrain, there was a hilarious satisfaction in jumping a boss with my entire party in what almost felt like medieval gang violence. So that's a win-win. Dragon's Dogma 2 stayed consistently engaging. Even when I was upset beyond belief, even when the main quests would fall short, the open world and everything in it still kept me coming back. I didn't rush my playthrough at all, and I still missed a lot. Still haven't started the Elvish quests. I didn't get to see the Sphinx Lady everybody was horny about online. There's lots of caves, new equipment, buying multiple houses, side quests, romance. There's so much stuff that I can do in Dragon's Dogma 2, and all that will have to be saved for a leisurely New Game Plus playthrough at some point in the future. Fingers crossed that there's maybe an expansion or something released sometime soon. And if not, then I can't wait for another decade for the third game. 
She gonna be dragging on my dog till I call her Ma. <laughs> Hun, that's not funny. She gonna be dragging on my dog till I call her Ma. Yes, I thought, I thought you were recording that. I didn't want to laugh. I am though. Do you want me to laugh? I mean, it's now if you laugh, it'll be okay. weird. <laughs>